And so today's hearing continues uh, on our work as a committee to accomplish that goal. Uh, Congress is faced with 21st century problems. Uh, we utilize uh, old rules, uh, old processes, old technology, and we're trying to solve, solve many of these uh, modern day problems. With instant information and communication the norm, one of the biggest challenges we face is the ability to actually hear each other through all the noise that's out there. With a click of a mouse or a tap on an app, the public can share their opinions to their elected representatives, yet it's really hard for us to keep up. The Congressional Management Foundation, as you noted, shared that nearly 30 million messages are sent to the House annually. 30 million messages, that's remarkable. Technology has quickly and easily expanded the ways we interact with one another, uh, but we just need to improve the way we use technology to, uh, meaningful, to communicate meaningfully. So uh, each of us, uh, we're tasked with an important job, and today's experts will uh, help us examine how to have more meaningful conversations and engage with those we serve. So Mr. Chairman, thanks for holding this committee, and I yield back. Thanks. Uh, today we welcome the testimony of our three witnesses. Uh, first, Brad Fitch, President and CEO of the Congressional Management Foundation. Uh, Mr. Fitch began working on Capitol Hill in 1988, where he served in various positions for 13 years. He left Congress in 2001 to work for the Congressional Management Foundation as, de as Deputy Director to CMF. He served as a management consultant for members of Congress, offering confidential guidance, conducting staff training programs, and writing publications on enhancing the performance of individual congressional offices and the institution. In 2010, he became president of CMF. Michael, is, do, is it Dr. Neblo? Okay, I got it. Stuck the landing. Uh, is an associate professor of political science at Ohio State University and also serves as the director of Ohio State's Institute for Democratic Engagement and Accountability. Was I supposed to say the Ohio State University? I'm not really qualified. Okay, all right. Sorry, that's what I got from Monday Night Football. Uh, Professor Neblo's research focuses on deliberative democracy and political psychology. Uh, his new book, Politics with the People, Building a Directly Representative Democracy, develops and tests a new model of politics connecting citizens and elected officials to improve representative government. Professor Neblo holds a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. And finally, Marcy Harris is a former congressional staffer and developer of constituent engagement tools. She is CEO and co-founder of PopVox, a neutral, nonpartisan platform for civic engagement and governing. Ms. Harris developed the concept for PopVox while working as a congressional staffer on the Ways and Means Committee. She was named a top 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company and has been a fellow with the Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democracy and New America, California. Uh, witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes and without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. And Mr. Fitch, you're now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and members of the Select Committee. On behalf of the Congressional Management Foundation, I wish to thank the committee for inviting CMF to testify on the state of citizen engagement. My comments are rooted in CMF's unique history of working with the Congress for the past four decades. While there are dozens of ways Congress can interact with constituents, such as social media, in-person town hall meetings, ad hoc meetings, the most prevalent and widespread form of democratic dialogue in America, and I use that term very loosely, is the exchange of identical mass email campaigns. Using data from House Information Resources and some of your software vendors, CMF estimates that the House of Representatives alone receives between 25 and 35 million messages a year from constituents. 75 to 90 percent of these communications are facilitated by associations and nonprofits with constituents in the member's district. While it's encouraging to see so many people engaged in public policy, these interactions appear to be largely superficial, devoid of any meaningful or thoughtful exchanges of ideas. In a CMF poll of grassroots directors of the association and nonprofit community, 79 percent said mass email campaigns was their top strategy to influence Congress. However, only 3% of senior congressional staff report that this strategy has a lot of influence on undecided lawmakers. Put simply, most of the associations and nonprofits that are generating the vast majority of email to your offices are employing methods that are neither effective to their advocacy efforts nor very helpful to congressional offices for public policy decision making. In addition, one study of congressional offices indicated that more than half of the members of Congress are not reading the mass mail reports of these campaigns coming into their offices. And a preliminary CMF analysis, and let me emphasize it is preliminary, of open rates by the constituents who receive these responses show the average open rate was under 40%. 
Now think about those numbers. Half of the mail going to Congress isn't read by members, and half of your replies are being ignored by constituents. That's a definition of a system sorely in need of reform. The news isn't all bad. Evidence suggests that members of Congress deeply care about their constituents' views. In CMF surveys of both members of Congress and congressional staff, constituent meetings and constituent views are the most important factors in shaping congressional opinion and in understanding the impact of public policy decisions on the nation. The concept that the governing bodies of the nation are listening to those they govern is a bedrock principle upon which this republic was founded. And by and large, members are doing their best they can to listen to constituents. So if both Congress and constituents believe in a healthy, robust engagement, and it's important, Congress then must adapt to 21st century standards. For the committee's consideration, CMF recommends the following efforts. First, the rules governing the use of the Frank should be updated. As most congressional communications directors are aware, these rules were designed when the printing press was the primary communications tool. CMF recommends that the committee create a task force of current press secretaries, perhaps from your own offices, to examine and recommend changes to the frank. Second, Congress should incentivize practices and technologies with proven track records for improving citizen engagement. As Dr. Michael Nebla will testify shortly about the joint research that we did with his colleagues, on online town hall meetings. This is promising research that suggests you can build trust through technology. Third, we should look at current examples in Congress for creative solutions. Last year, CMF launched a new program for Congress, the Democracy Awards, and we specifically identify best practices in transparency, accountability, and innovation. Through pioneering, consistent, and thoughtful use of technology, the winners of the Democracy Awards can serve as models for other offices. Finally, let me conclude with this data point. It's from the Rasmussen Polling Company, which for the last decade has asked Americans this question. Do most of members of Congress care what their constituents think? The percentage of respondents who agree with that statement has hovered between 11% and 21%. Americans simply don't believe you're listening to them. And yet CMF, your staff, your colleagues, and every advocate in Washington knows you are. The challenge is you have to convince your constituents that you are listening. Whatever system evolves in the years to come. Whatever this committee recommends and the House adopts, the core features and attributes must facilitate and communicate that Congress is listening to constituents. Congress has this extraordinary opportunity for constituent engagement that for the most part it is failing to take advantage of. We recognize that congressional staff levels have been cut while total communications have skyrocketed. All the more reason to use efficient and effective technology to better build relationships with your constituents. While Congress can't control the wholesale level of democracy that includes the internet and social media, you can control the retail level of democracy, the direct interaction between you and your constituents. This retail level of engagement is vital for increasing trust between citizens and elected officials in our democracy. And solutions that hold true to that maxim afford Congress the opportunity not only to improve how it engages with constituents, it can actually boost Americans' faith in our government. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Neblo, I now recognize you for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Graves. Oh. Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Graves, members of the Select Committee, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Um, my work focuses on deliberative democracy, that is, how to improve the quality of the discussions that lead up to policy decisions. Unfortunately, trust and approval, as Brad has just uh, pointed out, trust and approval of Congress on this front remains near their all-time lows. Nor are individual members immune to this trend. Trust and approval at the individual level are also falling. Much of this discontent comes from constituent sense of being disconnected from the work of their representatives and their belief that politics is exclusively responsive to organized interests rather than to the concerns of regular citizens. Traditional methods of communicating with members, such as constituent mail, email, and phone calls, are not likely to help this problem much. Incoming messages are often wildly unrepresentative of district opinion if they're from the district at all, with many coming from activists or mass mailings organized by interest groups. Activists and interest groups should have their voices heard, of course, but those messages should not drown out what the rest of the district might have to say. Moreover, most offices are overwhelmed by the sheer volume of incoming communication and have diminished capacity to distinguish useful, inf useful information from noise. Thus, we urgently need to find better ways to reconnect regular citizens to elected officials. I am part of a research collaboration called Connecting to Congress. Our team developed deliberative online town halls to test whether carefully designed technology can help solve this problem. The approach relies on five key design features distilled from over a decade of scientific research. 
First, in and so far as possible, recruit a diverse group of constituents that genuinely represents the district. This exposes members to what a good cross-section of their whole constituency thinks, not just the usual suspects. Second, focus the session on a single topic. Discussing a single topic ensures that both elected officials and constituents move beyond talking points to really dig in on the issues. Third, provide balanced factual reading material on the topic prior to the event. This ensures that all constituents feel empowered to participate effectively and interact on a common basis of factual evidence. Fourth, have a neutral third party host and moderate the event. Third parties ensure that elected officials move beyond screened softball questions and scripted responses, and they signal to the constituents that the events are not an infomercial. We found that constituents value such authenticity very highly and reward members for it well beyond any advantages of tightly controlling the script. Finally, have the elected official participate live in the session through streaming video and or audio. Constituents can see in real time that the official herself is engaged rather than a staffer. This confirms that the constituents have a direct connection to the elected official. We evaluated these design principles in collaboration with a bipartisan group of 13 members of Congress conducting more than 20 deliberative online town halls as part of our study. Our current initiatives update and extend these principles to more cutting edge technologies. What we observed in our town halls was completely different from the kinds of shouting matches or gotcha traps one sees at many town halls today. People wanted to participate in our events at very high rates, especially those who are not highly engaged in politics already. Indeed, our participants were more representative of eligible voters than our actual voters. Moreover, we found that many people seem ill-informed not because they don't care, but because they believe it is not worth their time to stay informed, because nobody will listen anyway. But when they think that their member really will listen, they are quite willing and able to become informed. The discussions themselves were remarkably reasoned, respectful, and substantive. As one participating member noted, quote, there's so much overheated rhetoric about this issue, it was immigration, um, that it's really refreshing to see people grappling with it in a serious and civil way. The overwhelming majority of participants, 95%, said that the sessions were, quote, very valuable for democracy, and 97% said that they would want to participate in another. The sessions were also very valuable for members. Participating members saw, on average, a 37% increase in participants' trust in them and a 35% increase in job approval. Four months later, participating constituents were more likely to vote and 10% more likely to vote for the member who consulted with them in this way. Our recommendations, then, do not amount to eat your vegetables. Quite the opposite. Our message is that with innovative outreach efforts, elected officials can do well by doing right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and Ms. Harris. Thank you, Chairman Summer and Vice Chairman Graves and members of the committee. I appreciate this opportunity. I am honored to be working with the American Political Science Association's Task Force uh, on Congressional Reform Subcommittee on Technology and Innovation. We're working on recommendations for this committee. As mentioned, I'm also a proud former staffer with deep love for this institution. And I am the co-founder and CEO of Popbox, a technology platform with a mission to inform and empower individuals and make government work better for everyone. I came to Washington in 2006 for law school uh, I was an intern with the Ways and Means Committee and then transitioned to counsel in the member's personal office, and I can tell you it was like stepping back in time uh, to move from looking up cases digitally and taking notes on a laptop to the paper-based system of Congress. From almost day one, I kept a list of all the things that I thought somebody should fix, and my office colleagues put up with me telling them about it every day. Uh, I thought that someone should list the bills online, allow organizations and constituents to weigh in with a, an account and post their positions so that the public could see what Congress was hearing, and that individuals should have the opportunity to have outward anonymity, but to send along their real names, real addresses with the messages that were going into Congress in a standardized way that could be easily processed within offices. And so I had this idea, and I thought, great, this is something Congress should build. So I asked for the office that does that. And I was told that uh, in, in contrast to the architect of the Capitol, which exists to take care of the physical infrastructure of Congress, there was no, in, no infrastructure and no office to take care of the digital infrastructure of Congress in a bicameral and bipartisan way. If you wanted to build something for House Democrats, fine. If you wanted to build something for Senate Republicans, fine. But for the whole, the whole Congress itself, 
uh, that didn't exist. But I did find a ragtag group of uh, web geeks, we, we called ourselves in the day, of, of staffers and supporters who got together to think about how Congress could use technology better. And you've heard already from some of these folks in your hearings, and a lot of the initiatives that have happened over the years have come out of those early conversations. So I left the Hill in 2010 to form PopVox, and that name comes from Vox Populi, Voice of the People, with my co-founders Roshna Chowdhury and Dr. Joshua Tauber. And we've, we built the system. We've delivered millions of messages from constituents over the years, posted thousands of organization positions. Uh, but of course, the fact that you're holding this hearing means that we didn't solve all of the problems. We solved one technical problem, and we found thousands more that need to be addressed. Uh, I'm happy to tell you how we're working on that to this day. But I also want to share three framing uh, observations to think about where we are. As you heard from Brad, individuals are engaging at scale, and that's not going to stop. There's lots of reasons for that, including the professional advocacy tactics that were just discussed, but also the rise of cable news and partisan news coupled with the decline of local news outlets. People have fewer sources of information now about their local school board or city council, but they can spend 24 hours a day hearing about the latest battles of the na at the national level, and the, you are perceived as their only outlet for addressing these issues that they care about. Americans are experiencing a high level of political stress, and you see the results in your inbox. Third, social media has been a blessing and a curse for lawmaker constituent relations. It's provided an opportunity for more uh, direct engagement with constituents, but it's also opened the floodgates for trolls and misinformation, leading some to reject certain platforms entirely. Disinformation is proliferating, this is number two, and Congress has a role to play in countering it. In a time of decreasing trust, rising disinformation targeting Americans, this communication between members in Congress and their constituents is not just a matter of mass advocacy. It's crucial to our national and economic security. The millions of people who are contacting you every year, for them, this may be their only interaction with government. It's an opportunity for them to express concerns, to share opinions and personal experiences, and even offer ideas for improvement. Uh, but it's also a, an opportunity for them to hear back factual information and to get a sense that their voices matter. The third point is that technology created this problem, and it's the key to addressing it. In any other industry, massive quantities of input from customers would be a considered a net positive, not a problem to be fixed. Hearing from constituents at scale, even via form letters and scripted phone calls, is an opportunity for valuable insight. The 541 offices in Congress are a low margin, resource limited market with high switching costs serving a small, served by a small group of vendors with minimum competitive pressure. The pain of inadequate technology is borne primarily by staffers or in, junior staffers or interns with little or more decision making power and market forces are not going to change this without a little help. I'm happy to offer more discussion and recommendations in my written testimony about what we're doing to work on this problem. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you each for your testimony. Uh, I want to make sure we uh, dive into questions, so I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes for questions. And I want to start with uh, Mr. Fitch. You mentioned a study of congressional offices that found that about half of the emails going to con Congress aren't read by members, and about half of the replies from member offices are being ignored by constituents, which as someone who spends 11 hours on an airplane perfecting all of the emails that I'm sending off to constituents was really painful for me to hear. Oh. Um, so talk more about this and your thoughts on what we can do about it. Well, um, in terms of the communications coming in, I. I think that, frankly, a lot of it's not your fault in the sense that a lot of the value that is trying to be created by the association and nonprofit community, it just they're not sending in good communication. So they need to improve the quality on their end. And the Congressional Management Foundation is the leading trainer in that area. And we're trying to get associations and nonprofits to, frankly, improve their act um, and make it a little more higher quality. Um, why they're not opening the reply is a open question to us. We, I said well, this is a very preliminary piece of research we've done, and why would you not open a reply from a member of Congress? Is there a technological reason? Is it being caught in a spam filter? Is it because there's a delay in responding? Um, is it because they didn't invest a lot of time into doing that? And that's something that in the future we will want to explore and find out why constituents aren't interested in the reply. Um, but in general, I think that the 
increasing the quality of the type of communication going back and forth. If I know I'm going to get something from a good member of Congress. I was just doing uh, interviewing um, a uh, emergency nurse about what she felt was a good experience, and she was describing an e-newsletter that she really enjoyed getting from her Secretary of State. And she enjoyed getting an e-newsletter from a politician. And she was describing this experience because it offered direct information. It clicked on other information that she could read and learn about. So I think increasing the quality of the interaction via email actually is one of the keys to it. I also wanted to ask uh, either to you, Mr. Fitch, or Ms. Harris. Um, both of you recommended making some improvements to the rules of the Frank. And uh, I, I, I'm just curious what specific changes you would make to try to bring Congress into the 21st century. Well, I, uh, specific changes I, I don't have, but I think that it's important to, to emphasize what the Frank is. We get the question all of the time, and there's tremendous confusion among constituents about the difference between, say, a campaign account or an official account. Many people don't understand that their information is not shared from the official use to the campaign use, and that there are limitations on the way that Congress can communicate when they're doing so under the Frank. So the fact, especially in, in a time of disinformation, that you can't share untrue, overtly political or personal information uh, through Frank's communication, I think is something that, that should be emphasized almost like a better housekeeping seal uh, that, that constituents can understand is a protection for them. Quickly, um, well, personally, I think you should change the name of the Frank when I talk about this outside of Washington. They ask me, <laughs> who is Frank? Yeah. And, and why is he sending me this mail? I yeah. mean, it's a 240-year-old rule. I'll call it the Commission on Citizen Engagement or something like that. Um, and to be honest with you, the last time I dealt with the Franken Commission was when I was on the Hill, and that was 18 years ago. And so I don't know. That's why I recommended that a task force of current press secretaries, they're the only ones qualified to know the details and the arcane rules that they have to live by um, to change them, to, to update them. That's in the, the, sort of the detail set. On the big picture side of things, does Congress want to look at some of the more sort of ethical questions of what they can and cannot do using taxpayer money. And that's more of a political question and less of an administrative session. And it's frankly, you know, a dicey one at that, because when you get into the area of mass mailings and the use of advertising to advertise town hall meetings and digital ads, you know, that's a much tougher question. And I do put those in very separate buckets. And the second bucket is probably not one your press secretaries want to wrestle with. Right. Let me end, Dr. Neblo. Um, are there are there any things happening in other jurisdictions at the local, you know, in, in, at the local level, at the state level, in other countries that might be adapted uh, in terms of constituent correspondence at the federal level or constituent engagement? There are. Um, so at the state and local level, a number of jurisdictions have experimented with adapting something called uh, participatory budgeting, um, which involves people very directly in forming a budget. Um, but they've adapted those principles to give feedback um, to markups and to um, uh, committee work uh, in a very concrete, almost real-time way. The only example I know of this um, in the context of the Congress was Representative Daryl Issa. Um, uh, did this in a subcommittee hearing um, online. It was very innovative. To my knowledge, it's not been picked up. Um, but that's one that I think could be very exciting um, and interesting. And then other countries are doing an enormous amount. Um, France just launched what they call their Great National Conversation. Um, and Ireland has uh, put together what they call their uh, the Irish Citizens Assembly. France, Canada, Belgium, many other countries uh, are experimenting with ways to engage their constituents. I wasn't clear. What, what did, what did um, Congressman Issa do? So live during, um, I'm sorry, I didn't explain it well. Um, during a, a subcommittee um, hearing, there was live input um, via the internet from um, general constituents. Um, and they were allowed to upvote and downvote various sort of consideration. It was real-time uh, feedback. Now, I realize that's dicey in certain respects, but in this context, it was wildly popular with the constituents, um, and I think that the, the committee uh, found it useful as well. Super. Thank you. Vice Chair Graves. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the testimony and the thoughts. Uh, I know one of the challenges we all face and our offices face are just the, the I guess the enormous amount of emails we get that are probably automatically generated out there, you know, from advocacy groups, and they do a really good job of getting their membership involved, and that's probably a whole other topic, a whole other issue. But from a, a, a constituent management and, and uh, or engagement process, you've probably seen some companies that deal with a lot of consumers that have a lot of 
They, it's a lot of transactions are occurring or returns or customer issues that they deal with. Any good examples you could share with us that the, how they might use technology to manage large inputs of information and, and opinions and, uh, and resolving problems or challenges. And Ms. Harris, maybe you know from some of your research you could share with us good examples. And do they do it in-house or is it you know, services that they purchase, provide, or such? Yeah. Well, there, there are multiple CRM, consu consumer relationship management platforms out there that are, that are really tailored to the, the customer experience, and, and most companies use that. And, and again, the volume that Congress is dealing with in each individual office, it is a lot, but for a normal business, that would be a goldmine. That would be very exciting to them, to be hearing from their customers so frequently and able to discern insights from that incoming information. And they would take great care to processing it, not, not putting that all on individual people, but using technology to process it and glean insights and respond quickly and build a relationship, which is something that is completely within the reach of, of Congress to do. Uh, it's, it's just, quite frankly, very tough the way that procurement is set up within the offices. As you know, you know it's cliche to say 541 small businesses, but that really is what it is. Uh, and some of the limitations that come from the vendor structure itself, I think there are ways to incentivize new ideas and maintaining um, uh, good uh, customer service levels and even understanding what the issues are in a way that, that these vendors can address. Very quickly, Mr. Yeah. Vice Chairman, I think in the online town hall meeting uh, department, um, the sports community does a really good job of that. I've, I've got an op-ed in my head. I haven't finished it, but it's what the Pittsburgh Penguins can teach Congress about constituent engagement. Um, I, I, it's a great headline. I haven't got it built out yet, but the principle is there. there's definitely some lessons there in the entertainment and the sports community on scaling it. I mean, they can have 100,000 people in one of their online town hall meetings. You could, too. I see. Any uh, examples of... Uh, additional companies that are specific that we might want to, you know, speak with or learn more about? Well, if you want to... And if not, that's fine. I'm just curious. It, it, no, not really, because if you went to an individual company and say, you're going to get 50,000 contacts from your customers, and you have three staffers to respond to it, and they look at you like you got two heads. That's part of the problem is you don't... You can't expand. Amazon would hire more people, and you can't. Good point. Good point. Um, and may, maybe to each of you, if, so... You've really been, you've had the opportunity to look at Congress from the outside and probably identify problems and, you know, and say, hey, you know, why can't you fix this? It's right there in front of you. Can you just maybe name for us like what you see as the number one biggest challenge we have that we could solve with innovation and technology that this committee should address? And, and, and Dr. Neblo, I'll, I'll start with you. Great, thank you. Um, so the number one problem in my view is understanding what the considered opinions of a good cross-section of, of a whole district or state look like, that it's very hard, um, even if, if you're able to afford polls, which most offices aren't on a lot of issues, there'd be a concern that these are just top of head opinions and that don't really ref reflect considered opinion. Um, but it would be enormously valuable, I think, to members to know what a representative sample of their constituents um, think when they've had a chance to actually think about it. Mm -hmm. Great. Ms. Harris? Yeah. So I, I do think that this technology question is, is a big one, not just because it helps to glean insights from constituent input. I think there are lots of other ways that Congress can leverage technology, but because it also gives you your staff back. So if you have, if, you, if the members of your staff are able to spend less time doing data entry and more time either speaking directly with constituents or doing policy research, then you're getting higher quality advice. And so I think it's a staff capacity issue as well to get the technology right. Maybe Mr. Fish, just to finish this up, what is our number one challenge to this innovation, to achieving this in your mind? Because you are giving us some great, great thoughts and ideas today. Well, I'm going to go a little different than the technology route. You know, a box of buttons is really easy to fix. You can make it do anything. Making people change is hard. And changing the culture right now and the workflows and the processes by which members of Congress and how they write their replies back is one of the biggest challenges. I was asked a few years ago what the biggest obstacle is to improving the democratic dialogue in America. And my reply was, bad writing. And it's on both sides of the equation. I mean, you look, you look at your standard letter that you're sending back, and it's drafted by an LC who wants to be promoted to LA. And so they want to show their policy chops off, and they show a lot of big, you know, big paragraph on this and that. And it's just not what it's needed. So I take a little bit different tact in the sense that that is within your control. But it's really hard to change people's culture and the way they've been doing things for 30, 40 years. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Uh, next up, Mr. Pocan. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for being here today. Um, try to get to three subjects if I can, but the first one, um, Mr. Fitch, uh, I know you used to work for Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin. We appreciate uh, your service to a Wisconsin member. Um, you, you mentioned about the volume, and I, I, I don't want to get, I guess it's not pushback, but I like the volume. I like to know that people are reaching out to us. Right. Granted, there may be some challenges in taking it back, but coming from the small business world, um, you know, uh, open rate on average, I just looked it up while we were talking, it, it across industries is like 16 to 21 percent. So the fact that you got a 40 percent open rate, given that they get fundraising emails from us to a nauseating level, I think is pretty high. I think that might be maybe more of why you get even a 40 percent, but that's double the, the open rate out there. So I'm not, I don't want to do anything that, that stops that communication. I, I can say there could be a better way of doing it. I want to keep that rate up, but I actually, um, you know, that's a pretty good rate. I think an open rate when I look across what I'm used to uh, on the business side. So it, it, was I missing something, what you're trying to yeah, say the in there, just so I can make sure? Yeah, the 16% you're referring to is open rate of proactive communications. So if I'm a direct mailer and I'm an emailer, yeah, 15% is actually terrific. The average is probably a little lower. Yeah. This, that's not one up. The 40% isn't the open rate to proactive communications. It's reactive. It's something a constituent has sent to you and you send a reply back. So why would 60% yeah. of the people of your constituents not care what you think if they've asked you a question? Probably because they got two fundraising emails from right. everyone else along the way, right? So right. I still think, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I don't want to do anything that slows the rate down, but I, I do think 40% is still not bad uh, given, in fact, I, I just looked my email rate for my business. I got to work on a little bit uh, to <laughs> get my numbers up. Um, on the, uh, Ms. Harris, a question specifically on other models. So I'm familiar with companies like Zendesk, right? Now there's that can be really interactive, right? You can get, someone can actually type, get to a person, get a response, but I don't think we have the procurement process set up to actually use models that people use in the business world, especially small business world versus, and that I think are really good for communication. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I absolutely think you're right. Um, not that you need to outsource the constituent communication because this always does need to be handled by Congress, but but to have vendors use commercial tech or commercial techniques that work work elsewhere and and build them in a way that works for Congress, absolutely makes sense. There are lots of ways to automate really good information, getting back to the constituents in a timely way, that is, that are your words that that. Uh, that you have used to respond to a, to a certain topic, but making it so that the unique questions bubble up, the unique points, the unique story or experience that actually gives a personal view to the policy that you're considering, right now that's getting drowned out by the volume. So I think new ways of doing things are, are, are really important. And, and I think just a little, structure, little change to the structure of how, how the, the vendor outreach and procurement works could, could change a lot of that. Any other responses to that? Because I, I do like that type of software where people can instantly open up the you know a chat window comes up, you're there, you're available, you're answering a question. Sometimes you don't got to take the uh, abuse they give to our poor interns who are answering something, but uh, is that something that's a model that would make sense? And some of your vendors are working on that, not quite AI, but going in that direction where if a constituent writes in and has a particular phrase, you know, the computer will say, oh, you're writing in about immigration specifically on this topic, you know, people coming over our borders from Canada or something like that, um, and which is something you would worry about from Wisconsin. <laughs> um, but uh, There's lots of them, remember? <laughs> waves and waves. And, and so it would, th it would look at that and be able to propose, for example, responses back. So that just increases the speed with which they're getting a, uh, a response back from the office. And, and the last question, and Dr. Nebula, you brought this up. So the contacts that come into the office for the most part are screened because they have to have a zip code that is from the district. Mm -hmm. I love Facebook Live town halls because if I'm not home, I think it's a good way to still do a town hall. My answer, of course, I want to change our schedule so we're home two weeks of the month. Uh, I think some of us have talked about this. So you actually talk to your constituents for real, but it, short of that, Facebook uh, Live town hall. Problem is it can be anyone from around the country who responds. Is there an easy tool out there that we could try to to deal with so that you people could, you know that they're your constituents you're actually talking with? Sure, so Facebook um, uh, town has something called a town hall function. Um, and uh, they have constituent badges. Now people okay. can lie, 
Yeah. Um, but they can't sign up to be the constituent of 535 members of Congress. They can sign gotcha. up to be the constituent of three, two senators and a representative, right? Um, and so I'm actually, our team uh, is actually working with Facebook to improve um, their, well, hopefully improve their town hall function and to run Facebook lives through the town hall function would solve this certification problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you all have all talked a lot about constituent engagement. Uh, could you define that uh, for me? I took one of uh, CMF's classes uh, two decades ago, mm -hmm. right and we were talking about postcard campaigns instead of email uh, <laughs> campaigns, uh, and uh, the, the conversation was, hey, I've got a limited number of staff that could be making a real difference uh, for constituents, could be making a real difference for public policy, but they're bogged down in what is not engagement, uh, it's right. just response. So what is quality constituent engagement as we're talking about our goals? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that, Congressman, because that is definitely the direction the CMF is going in in the decade, is to look at constituent engagement holistically and not through the silos. Because right now it's very much siloed, right? Your legislative shop looks at the mail. Your uh, communication shops look at e-newsletters and social media. Your district office sets up town hall meetings. But if you looked at the relationship, the entire sort of interaction the connection that constituents have with you and looked at it as a relationship, which I know is going to scare all your staffers to death, the idea that you want to build relationships with staffers, but you do if you want that constituent to have a positive user experience with the office and looking at it holistically and not through the silos. So you ask yourself, what is a high quality interaction? Have they had the opportunity to ask a question? What's the forum? Is it an online forum or is it one that is more restrictive that doesn't allow them to ask questions? Do they feel as though, as Dr. Nebolo said, they haven't asked advocate in the room um, being a moderator. And that's why we're very high on the research that we've done with um, this team of, of academics. So it's looking for that quality engagement where the constituent genuinely believes that they are being heard. And that's the metric you measure by. Well, Dr. Nebel, your research seemed to go away from all the folks who are reaching out uh, to me. Uh, you were reaching out uh, to folks, not the open call for a town hall meeting, but I'm coming to knock on your door and asking you to come to a town hall uh, meeting uh, uh, with me. Is that, is, is, is quality defined by proactively seeking the engagement as opposed to reactively uh, uh, responding to engagement? Yes, sir. So. Um, I, I think incoming communication in standard forms is great. As I mentioned, activists and interest groups need to be heard. Um, but what we're really focused on is trying to get beyond the usual suspects. And there, the number one reason people say that they haven't engaged with their member of Congress or reached out to an elected official or participated in something like this is that nobody asked them to. It's that simple. Uh, well, I mean, it's actually not quite that simple, but it, it's, it's, you can go a long way towards simply trying to affirmatively find the people who don't normally show up, um, rather than just putting out an open call and then the most active people do show up. So I think there's a dimension of quality that gets added when you have a broader cross-section of your constituency involved, and otherwise, just everything that Mr. Fitch said, I, I agree with wholeheartedly. The, so tell me about that, Ms. Harris. Dr. Nebelow says uh, we, we've got folks who are not engaging because they haven't been uh, asked. You say folks are engaging at uh, scale, but that may simply be in response to their latest uh, nonprofit group saying, check these, three, uh, check these three boxes. What does individuals are engaging mean? Yeah, I think, I think we've got both. Um, and I've been hanging out with these political scientists now, so I've, I've learned the concept of, of political efficacy. So when a, when a constituent engages, do they leave that engagement, in, by, by engaging meaning either heard from you or sent you something or talked with you or attended a town hall meeting, do they feel when they walk away that a person like me can actually influence how our government works? Does my voice matter? And what we've seen in some of the research is that typical, sometimes, in fact, the social media platforms right now are, are kind of optimized for something other than that. Not to create that feeling and let people feel more informed, but to drive a click and get them mad and get them angry. And, and that drives a lot of engagement and gives a lot of eyeballs to ads, but it doesn't necessarily give you better information to make decisions or leave a constituent feeling good about the interaction and having more information that they deal with. We're, we're working now on a, on a different kind of way for them to engage so that you can create a post kind of like you would on Facebook 
Anybody can follow you, but only your constituents can engage in a way that actually lets you have a, a transparent but closed discussion with your constituents. In the same way that we're underfunded with staff, I am underfunded with time, <laughs> my chairman and vice chairman. But two questions I'd like for you to, th to, to think about and, 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 and get back uh, to me on. One is thinking about quality engagement. Can I provide that incentive so a, a member of Congress who is going that extra mile for that quality engagement gets a little extra MRA uh, money? Can I measure effective engagement? This is the people's money. If you're a better people's representative, can I get you uh, more money? And secondarily, I like the quality standards in the Frank, but it, it takes time for the Franking Commission to respond to that. I'd like to do away with the Frank as a, as a signature on a mail uh, package, but I want to keep the quality of the correspondence. What is there in technology that I don't have to wait 36 hours to get something back from the Franking Commission so that I can respond? To how can I police quality using technology uh, in ways that uh, speed uh, response time? I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the, thank the witnesses. Thank you. Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a lot of very interesting information here, and I, I appreciate it. Um, the, here's, a, here's a concern. Actually, Ms. Harris, you and um, uh, Mr. Nublo have some, some similarities in, in, in your um, suggestions. Uh, and, uh, but I'm, you know, my mother-in-law comes back from a, uh, her uh, annual tea with her friends and she uh, comes to our house and she says, you know, um, I still love you and I, I want you to know that, uh, you know, I'm not going to fight this thing since you're in Congress, but I, don't you think it's a little wrong for you guys to get your salary for life um, after you uh, are sworn in? And because uh, I'm, you know, where, where did you get that from? And she said, That's, that was the conversation at the uh, lunch in the day. You guys get your salary for life, and, uh, and you don't have to get the same insurance that other people get. You get special congressional insurance. Uh, and she, there's a whole list. She just, go, go, all of the things that, that we were getting that I wish we did get. But uh, I just, uh, um, you know, we're, we're, we're probably dealing with things that some of our predecessors didn't have to deal with, this disinformation. And I, I don't know how we deal with that. Uh, and then to get both of you plugged in on, on top of that, um, you know, something is wrong. And, I, and it may not just be here. I mean, we need to, we need to fix whatever we need to fix. But uh, I'm going home t uh, tonight, I'll get home tomorrow. I'll be called senator maybe five times over the weekend. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I know you guys. They get to you get the same thing. You know, somebody walked to the senator. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. yeah, yeah. Senator may be the worst, but but. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, you know, my, my concern. We're talking about modernization. I mean, we we got to do something. We got to fix things here. But we got to also try to think about the fact that civics and government are are, are not, you know, in, inextricable parts of a high school um, academic requirement anymore. And and I just think that we're we're we're, we're losing people because they don't they just don't know. Um, and and I, I don't know how to, I mean, I'll, we'll, I'll get a phone call, you know, uh, you know, we don't, we don't support you closing down the Brooklyn school. Oh, uh, oh I mean, it's, it, and, and then if you say, well, you know, you, you have to call the school district, uh, there you go again, you guys don't want to, uh, you know, help you want to give us off to another agency. I mean, anyway. Fix it, can you? Can you uh. I like that. Um, so, Mr. Cleaver, that, that is, is such a good point. Certainly with the decline of, of uh, civic education, the decline of local news, 
uh, and the rise of, of disinformation. So one of the things that we're working on at Popbox uh, this year is starting to pilot local versions of our platform where a constituent would log in and they would see all the people who represent them up and down the vertical. So from their local city council person on up to their uh, senator and, and, and president. And one of the ways that we're measuring our, go our goals with that is do people know who represents them and what is a local versus a federal issue? It's, it's a really tough challenge, as you say, to, to respond if, if the people are not starting with a baseline understanding of what is in your, your purview and what belongs at the city council. And, and Mr. Mr. Chair, or Mr. Cleaver, this is one of the things I was mentioning about the difference between wholesale, wholesale and retail level interactions. You know, I do a lot of speeches to outside groups and I have to start out by pointing out that House of Cards was not a documentary. <laughs> okay, it's fictional. Um, and they don't believe that. They, you know, I think that's the way it is. And yeah. the challenge, but you have this opportunity when that constituent interacts with you, you, know, you have 50,000 opportunities on average a year when constituents are interacting with you, 50,000. And as Mr. Pocan said, most business people would look at that as an incredible opportunity to connect with that person. The challenges, the systems, and the culture that have been set up on Capitol Hill is to respond to them, to check a box. We send an email back, we're done. And that's one of the biggest challenges, is taking advantage of that opportunity, not looking at that interaction with the constituent as a burden. You know, my time is up. I, 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 I think we ought to consider not putting money into school districts that don't teach civics. Why? Okay. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Mr. Davis and then Mr. Timmons. You're in the on deck circle. Well, thank you. Great to follow you, Senator. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, hey, look, um, you know, Emmanuel's right. Uh, we we have a lot of issues in this country that we're facing when it comes to when it comes to communicating with your elected official. That we all need to take a step back, even from this committee, and help do a better job to ensure that we have more interaction, better civics. Uh, that's something that uh, you know we need to focus on. Happy to work with you on that. Uh, make sure that uh, you know if there's any ideas we have, I, I'd be happy to work with you, Emmanuel. Uh, I'm a former staffer, and you know this committee to me is an opportunity to fix a lot of the things that I didn't like as a staffer. You know, Ms. Harris, it's I'm glad that uh, you went on to some bigger and brighter things. You know, and I'm stuck here. <laughs> so, no, this is this is a great opportunity because to see. The entrepreneurial spirit of you, you taking frustrations, I'm sure, and also advances that you want to see implemented because you have a respect for this institution. Uh, your success story is something that I wish I would have had you here a couple hours earlier in this room because I spoke to many of the summer interns that are out here for the first time. I think they need to see people like you that, that move beyond to try and then make this institution better. And that's what we're all here for today. Um, I do want to get into some technology issues. You know, I am uh, very focused on and an advocate for broad increased technological advances within this institution. Uh, right now, specific to like CMS vendors or constituent management service vendors, you know, there are five approved vendors, but 90% of the market is, is given to two. And I don't think that is ripe then for innovation on how to make our underlying technological backbone be able to better communicate with our constituents, which is the goal of this, this whole hearing today. And, and thank you all for your testimony. I've learned a lot, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, we need to have more competition. I, I believe that. And I believe the technology, or lack thereof in many cases, of the House and within the CAO is limiting, limiting what we could do to talk to our, our, uh, our folks. And we still have to balance things like speech and debate clause within that, that operation. So Dr. Neblo, you've spent an enormous time researching and writing about connecting people and their representatives. What are some states or countries that do a better job in this institution in, than this institution with regards to connecting citizens to elected officials? There are, I mean, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. What else is out there? Yeah, um, well, thank you for the question. Um, so as I briefly mentioned before Ireland, uh, recently has done some very, very interesting and innovative um, things. They've convened what they call the um, Irish Citizens Assembly. And it's completely advisory. It wouldn't, you know, adapting it to the U.S. wouldn't require a constitutional amendment. Um, but it convenes a group of, uh, a random sample of uh, citizens in Ireland um, to come together and really dig in 
um, on pending issues and interact with the elected officials. In an earlier iteration of this, it was about 100 constituents and about, it was basically a select committee. It was about 30 members of the Irish Parliament um, that interacted um, uh, with them. Very, extremely popular and helped the uh, Ireland push through some very, very um, uh, difficult uh, issues and controversial uh, um, policy um, points that, that they were struggling with. Taiwan um, has a minister of inf information technology and um, constituent communication. Um, it's actually, I don't know if I would call it a cabinet level, but it's a, it's a high level position. Um, and uh, they have a wide infrastructure, online infrastructure to do constituent um, consultation uh, and to uh, really help. Things, some things actually not completely dissimilar um, to what PopVox is doing. To what Ms. Harris is doing? That's right. Let me, um, and I know my, my yeah. time is running oh, out because yeah. I had too much fun uh, debating back and forth with my favorite senator. Um, I do want to get Ms. Harris real quick. Uh, so Taiwan and Ireland, great, thank you. Um, look, technologically, we're doing better than we did 23 years ago when I started as a staffer. Uh, it, we have better storage, better email, better video content, what have you. Um, what are we still missing? Oh. Um, <laughs> look, well, there's, there's lots of exciting room for improvement. I, I mean, I think no. <laughs> Lots of ways to um, Im improve the, the way that offices are processing the information, but even the way that committees are receiving information during the, the early uh, 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 bill formation process from stakeholders and from constituents. Um, and, and there's also a way to improve the way that Congress uses data. So as uh, you know, Congress is passing a lot of great laws uh, helping the executive branch use data better and move to evidence-based policymaking, that's all got to land in this institution at some point, too. And I think over the, the coming uh, decade, we're going to see a lot of discussion about the balance between public participation and data and getting that mix right. Excellent. Well, listen, I know my time is up, and I always try to go over to make the chairman upset. <laughs> but I do want to tell you, thank you. This is not stuff that makes headlines every day, but it's very important to making our constitutional republic succeed as an institution here in the House of Representatives. I appreciate all your time, and thank you, for, and I yield back nothing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm going to begin by um, thanking Mr. Fitch for all this hard work. Um, I emailed you in July. On July 20th, I had won my primary, and I was uh, trying to get a head start, uh, optimistic that I would uh, end up being here. I emailed him at 6 in the morning, and he responded back, sorry for the delayed response. Vacation schedule is upon us. That was four hours and 40 minutes later. <laughs> so um, I appreciate uh, your hard work, and um, I just want to say thank you for all the resources you provide. Uh, getting orient oriented up here is very challenging, and uh, the Congressional Management Foundation is a, an incredible tool that um, I just want to say thank you for. So um, Ms. Harris, um, you, you talked about Facebook town halls, and I know that I've had to do the Facebook ID check uh, in order to be able to do certain things on the platform. Is there any potential that we could incorporate that into the uh, verified constituent, maybe a, a higher level to say, you know, Facebook has checked the ID of this person and they truly are your constituent? Is something like that possible? That's possible. I, I think that Facebook could do something like that. That's certainly something that we do on the platform as well. Uh, you know, there's there's definitely... There's always a question between how much, how many barriers to entry are being created for participation, because you certainly don't want to create too many for people to participate. Uh, but uh, there are certainly ways to do that. Um, so you spoke about Ireland and Taiwan. Uh, I was actually not even aware of this. My summer fellow was telling me about E-Estonia. Are you familiar yes. with that? Yeah, it's a so big deal. So they seemed, and again, I guess it's very easy when you have 1.3 million people, <laughs> and um, you're all very similar in nature. So I guess, um, is that the type of thing that we would be uh, talking about, just essentially trying to more modernize and rely on technology more and more? to? Yes, exactly. Um, and I can... I don't want to ramble on about Estonia, but it's, they've done a spectacularly good job, as has Iceland. You, you, as you point out, these are relatively small countries um, that have done it, but um, some larger countries, um, Canada, Australia, France, um, 
uh, and Taiwan being a middle-sized country have made serious innovations as well. So I don't think it's out of the question that the U.S. with some concerted effort could make real progress here. What's the largest country that has, you would say is the leader? I mean, Great question. Um, well, very recently France. Um, uh, but it's not, that's not so much technology driven, but constituent engagement driven. Um, the largest country on the technology front, um, you know, I'd, I'll have to get back to you on that. In what way is France leading with constituent engagement? Uh, so uh, the president of France recently initiated what he called the Great National Conversation, and on very short order organized a huge range of um, deliberative forums all over France with um, and, and there was an online component to it as well that yielded up, you know, like millions of people um, uh, were involved at least in a light way. Um, and uh, it was in response to the Yellow Vest crisis um, and trying to um, address the issues that the Yellow Vest pro protesters were talking about, but doing it without burning cars um, and doing it in a more deliberative format. Um. So it would seem maybe cutting edge would be the telephone town halls. I have yet to do one, but I've heard very good things. Uh, would you all agree that's probably the best use of technology to engage in a town hall manner as of now? I mean, I, I certainly would recommend using a, a video conferencing platform so that, you know, I think some are starting to try to experiment with Zoom and other products like that, but it's nice when they can see your face and you can see them. And I, I would add a social media component. Um, what some companies have found is when you add in other components, the average time that a constituent will stay on the call increases dramatically. Um, one company saw when they added a social media component to their telephone town hall, the average time a constituent would stay went from 12 minutes to 43 minutes. When you say add a social media component, meaning you incorporate a, a Facebook opportunity to where if you're on Facebook, you can just click and participate? Yeah, or you do polling or other things on the Facebook platform so they know that they could ask a question via Facebook, not just via the telephone. Now, is it only in, uh, incorporated with Facebook or would it also be uh, any other platform? You could use other platforms as well, sure. Okay. Um, I think I do have time left and I'll yield it back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you uh, for modeling good behavior. Uh, <laughs> next up, Mr. Newhouse. There must be a reason I'm last then, right, Eric? But thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, like uh, Mr. Davis said, this maybe isn't the, the topic that gets a lot of headlines, but it's uh, tremendously important. I think the, um, uh, the increase in the number of emails and correspondence that Congress gets and other, other branches of government, I'm sure, too, is indicative of the, uh, the hunger out there for people to be involved. Uh, and so it's a good thing, and it's a good thing to try to address how we can improve their ability to uh, engage and our ability to uh, respond. And uh, so all of these things, uh, if we can make some positive changes and to improve that process, it's, it's a great thing. At my state, the state of Washington, very um, I, I guess we could say have, have, have tried some things. One of the things I wanted to get your reaction on is uh, the opportunity. We, our state capital is on the west side of the state. There's a lot of land mass. That it takes a long time to get there, and some and sessions always during the winter, so it's not always easy. Uh, so they're starting uh, remote um, uh, opportunities for testifying in committees, which is... Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how it's working, but I think it's a great idea to increase uh, people's ability to um, provide their opinions. And again, respond to what I think is truly a, um, a, a huge desire on the part of our citizens to uh, have their say and, and have their opinion voiced. So in, in, are other places doing that on a scale that we could maybe try to look at doing around here? Any thoughts about those kind of innovations? I know there, there's some talk about doing some experiments uh, within committees here on the Hill working with um, uh, different universities. So Congress has 
uh, is able to work with land, land grant universities uh, to, to manage maybe a, a field hearing and, and host the video conference mm -hmm. there and even to work with libraries. I've heard uh, some, some proposals that are being bounced around, but you're right, there's vast expertise out in the wider country. Not everybody mm -hmm. who has really informed information to provide is sitting in Washington, D.C., so I think you're absolutely right. It makes so much sense. Yeah. Anybody else have any? reaction to that. I, I, I'm curious, I didn't realize that uh, Mr. Issa had, had kind of uh, what brought the committee hearing to a platform where people could participate. So I'm not sure. I'd like to learn more about that as well. And then, and then some of your comments about, uh, we do telephone town halls and Mr. Timmons, <laughs> you'll enjoy them when, uh, when, you, when you begin them. Uh, but adding a uh, dimension of I don't know if I'm the right facial example, but if you have more uh, a personal kind of um, dimension to that, people probably would respond to that, and you found that to be the case. Yeah, and I would add that, as Michael said, that the other elements of the experiment that seemed to be attractive was the single topic, and we did some additional experiments with oh. our academic partners um, and the topic is really important. For example, we heard anecdotally from members that did it on the opioid crisis that got a tremendously positive um, feedback from constituents, um, but when we tried transportation, it just didn't get people's motors going, no pun intended, um, but it just didn't get people excited. So having that single topic is important. Um, obviously, the experiment we did with Dr. Niblo was immigration, so it got people very energized, but the single topic uh, doesn't mean you eschew and never do multi-topic conversations with constituents. They would think that you're shutting them out. Um, but when we recently did a poll um, that hasn't been released yet of what members of Congress could do to make them feel like they're listening to constituents, and online town halls scored much better than telephone town halls. And I don't know why, maybe it's because of the anonymity of typing a question as opposed to asking a question, but online town halls were more interesting to, and demonstrated you were listening more than um, telephone town halls. So just um, one other thing that I've often been frustrated with, and no, you know, I have some very talented members in my staff, but one of the things that is difficult to, um, do is write a response to, to a, a letter that uh, you may get, you know, several hundred letters that are similar without, and we don't have time to have several hundred individual responses. How, how do you write a, um, a response that doesn't sound like it's just a form letter? Um. Well, you can come to one of our training sessions and we can go over that in detail. Um, but but it's, your, your goal is to connect with the constituent, not to respond. I was looking at a letter that a member of Congress showed us. They wanted to do exactly that and prove it. And it was dealing with uh, a constituent who wanted GPS tags attached to luggage or crates that animals are put in on airlines. Because if your bag goes to Minneapolis and you're in Phoenix, that's one thing. But if your cat goes to Minneapolis and you're in Phoenix, you're freaking out, right? Mm. So they wanted to petition the government, they're writing in, and that this member of Congress started by replying, thank you for contacting me about animal rights. Mm. It's like, no. I said, first thing I asked the uh, staffer, I said, does the member have any pets? He says, yeah, he has a dog. The way you start is, as a pet owner like you, Hmm. Your goal is to connect with the constituent, to connect to their value system and look broader as to why they're writing, okay. not just reading those words and replying to those exact words. Okay, good. Well, I see the red light and, and my effort to uh, upset the right chairman, uh, yeah. but he won't call on me last anymore. Thank you very much for being here. I want to, if, um, if folks have uh, any additional questions, I have a quick one. A lot of what we've talked about, and Dr. Neblo, particularly some of the things in, in your testimony, it seems like members of Congress can do, right? That, that there's nothing required in terms of recommendations made by uh, this committee. Arguably, we could make a recommendation trying to figure out like whether it's House admin or someone else could uh, sort of socialize these ideas or make sure everyone's aware of them or whatever. Uh, but any, so as you put, put yourselves in our chairs and think about what recommendations we ought to be making regarding some of these innovative ways for engaging our constituents, any advice to us about recommendations we ought to be making to the broader body? Uh, yes, um, and thank you for the question. Uh, so I, uh, my main recommendations would um, track the design principles that I talked about, um, and we feel very confident 
um, in recommending those. We, we've done a decade of research um, on those. So one of them is affirmative outreach, uh, that it's, it's surprisingly um, easy to pull people who, well, I, I wanna be careful about saying that, but um, you, you can do much better um, pulling in people who aren't the usual suspects if there's affirmative outreach um, to uh, constituents. But we're not prohibited from doing that now. I we? know. Um, right. which, which is, no, the, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So you meant recommendations for change. Yeah. Um, I'll defer to my colleagues on the panel on this. Um, most of what we talk about um, the stuff think, Congress can do. Yes, yeah, stuff Congress can do, and we want to help you do it. There are some financial prohibitions and challenges to going out and trying to identify constituents who are not normally engaged. So That's if you're right. looking for where the areas of the institution, there are things the institution pays for that it says, well, you need this. You need a telephone. So they're going to buy your phones for you. Well, why don't they help you get other constituents involved so it doesn't come out of your MRA? Why don't they give you a pool of online town hall meetings you can choose from that you use it or lose it? Um, so there are some creative ways to do it, but that's really thinking out of the box in a very uh, creative way. I mean, constituent engagement shouldn't financially penalize the office. You shouldn't have to determine whether or not you're going to do a telephone town hall meeting or give your office a bon staff a bonus. Will you help us think about that? Yeah. Okay. So I have a, a few suggestions. Um, the first, the vendor process has been brought up quite a bit uh, today. I think there are ways that through the Committee on House Administration that th that process could be changed or opened up in a way that would bring more interest from other vendors and also just make it clearer how one engages with Congress. It's really difficult for technology providers on the outside to even know which door to knock on. Uh, and also, I think if, if there were a way for the offices to submit, you know, either a survey or their feedback on the, the vendors that they're using so that there was a way for people who are purchasing this technology the first time to, to see, you know, what are the general issues or features of various products, just, you know, a Yelp for your CRM vendor would be great. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and I also think um, that one suggestion that I have is that, that the committee seriously think about suggesting that CRS help in providing uh, fact-based uh, issue summaries. I know that CRS is over t overwhelmed, but even one of the things that Dr. Neblo mentioned that constituents found so helpful in the sessions that he set up was that they started with just a general summary of the issues. We get this request all of the time at Popbox, can't you just put this bill in a quick, you know, bullet points for me? Not certainly any kind of partisan character characterization, but just an, an ABCD would be super helpful. And the member offices could use that in their follow-up so that constituents rece receiving information uh, back uh, that feels responsive to their issue. And then the other thing I just want to mention and praise is that the, the House itself maintains an API for the delivery of these um, advocacy emails. It's called the Communicating with Congress Proce Project, and Brad was instrumental in getting it going, and they do a great job. There's a lot of data there. There's a lot of data there to understand what the volumes are, and there's a lot of opportunity to leverage that API to build better tools, better analytics, to help Congress know what it's dealing with. And as the CWC goes into its 2.0 process, this committee could provide some suggestions for how they are, um, what they're looking for in that. Mr. Really Chairman, if I may add, uh, actually Congress did used to have a Yelp for um, their CRM. Uh, <laughs> from 2002 to 2004, the House hired the Congressional Management Foundation, and we created a consumer guide that was based on surveys of users and a feature list that was available. That's really interesting. Um, Mr. Woodall, you had a follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we sometimes talk about the 435 small businesses up here in a disparaging light as if, if we bind ourselves together, we can do better. Uh, I used to be next door to Daryl Issa, and all the equipment he threw out, I would take in. <laughs> because he was moving so much faster than the rest of us were. I value the 435 small businesses because somebody's going to do it differently, and they're going to set the model for the rest of us. Um, but in a variety of hearings, we've talked about that. As it relates to constituent engagement, can you speak to whether uh, you find value in the current 435 small business model or whether you would find uh, uh, value in a consolidated uh, a single house uh, uh, resource-driven uh, model? 
Well, we would recommend the, consider looking at the cost savings of consolidating some of the things that you do, like the bulk purchasing of computers. Like if you went to Dell and you asked them to buy 14 computers, which you do right now, they'll give you a price. I'm pretty sure they're going to give you a better price if you ask for 14,000. <coughs> So that's one thing. Also, the services and the software that you use in that area that often is for constituent engagement is another area you could explore. And having some numbers and research on that um, would, be, would be helpful. So those are just a couple of areas. In the innovation side, we'd like to see, continue to see offices innovate because that's where it does show best practices. I referenced the Democracy Awards. Uh, the winner of the 2019 Democracy Awards with Mark, Mark DeSalne, in part because of the constituent engagement that they do, in part because they live stream their town hall meetings on social media and through a variety of other formats. In 2018, the winner was uh, Rob Whitman from Virginia. His e-newsletter system is much more sophisticated than most offices. There's a lot of links to nonpartisan information, and it's very narrow in terms of what it offers to constituents, so it really localizes it for them. So we like to see these continued examples of best practices in offices to try to strive to do better. Oh, one thing I would just mention on that is is the, the house could really make a difference if it created a bulk purchasing account with uh, uh, providers like Apple or, or Google's App Store. Right now it's impossible to build apps specifically for Congress uh, because there's not an institutional uh, account for the house. Uh, so little things like that where Congress could act as a body instead of the multiple small businesses I think would, would uh, mean lots of, of better products for everyone. Real quickly, I, I would agree with my colleagues in that I think for some purposes, um, the laboratories of democracy kind of idea makes great good sense, but then we want centralized ability to sort of harvest those ideas and promote them as best practices. As you noted, Congressman Issa did this really innovative thing and it just kind of evaporated. Um, whereas uh, if there are successful innovations, having some mechanism, and I think this committee is one of them, um, to at least just recommend um, to your colleagues uh, some of the things that other uh, offices are finding useful. If, if I may just say one thing about the ISA project that, that, is, that is really interesting is that, as, as mentioned, it's not currently set up, but it was released as open source code. So the code for the Madison project that was put together by the OpenGov Foundation that, that Congressman and I have helped found uh, is available now. And I know there are several people working on pot uh, potentially uh, putting that code back up so that it's live. So the way that they did that and made that code available, even though their part of the project ended, someone else can pick it up and run with it, it really provides a benefit for everyone. Well, I thought this was really informative. So I uh, thank each of you for your testimony. I got, I think we all got a lot out of it. Um, uh, Dr. Neblo, because I gave a shout out to the Ohio State <laughs> University, my uh, Chief of Staff, who went to the uh, to Michigan, uh, has now tendered her resignation. Um, uh, nevertheless, I want to thank each of you uh, for your testimony today. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as plump, promptly as, our, as you are able. As I understand it, Mr. Fitch takes four hours and 40 minutes to respond. <laughs> um, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.